Thank you for watching this online class presentation from Cedarville University. Did you know Cedarville offers a fully online dual enrollment program for qualified 7th through 12th grade students? Students can choose general education or other core courses, all taught from a biblical worldview. We invite you to learn more at cedarville.edu slash college now. Judges and Ruth uh, are some, at least parts of Judges, are some of the ugliest, most discouraging, repulsive material you'd ever want to read. In fact, if it weren't in the Bible, I'd probably get in trouble for having you read it, if you've read all the way to the end. And yet, when you put these two books together, they are two of my absolute favorite books in all of the Bible. Because these are not simply abstract, Old Testament in the sense of irrelevant books. These are some of the most up-to-date, relevant bits of truth, truth teachings, that you can find anywhere in the Bible. And I just want you to know ahead of time how much I love this, not because that means you should love it, but do not let this sneak up on you. That is, what typically happens is about three-fourths of the way through these two lessons, people start to say, whoa, this is really interesting. But, but they haven't paid attention up to that point, and so some of the power is lost. Right? Don't let that happen. This is going to be good from the beginning, even though you don't totally understand why it's important. But this is like a really, really, really good movie where a lot of clues are embedded in the early chapters, and you miss them until you see the whole. But, but don't let that happen to you, okay? Listen carefully and put the whole thing together. This is an absolute masterpiece of life, death, love, and rescue. So let's, uh, let's start where we often do with the previous book that we had because indeed it is all one piece. It is all one big story and the way the book of Joshua finishes is the perfect introduction to Judges. So the book of Joshua finishes with we've got the land, check, we've got the nation, check, and now verse 32, that verse that says, and they took Joseph's bones and they buried them in the land. We all know who Joseph was. He's the ultimate picture of Messiah. When you see that, you're saying to yourself, wow, we've got everything but this last thing. We're two-thirds the way there. We're almost there. We can't wait to the next book. It's surely it's going to happen now, right? And so we come to Judges. Judges is going to speak about that, but without giving too much away, Judges is not going to answer it. So let's take a look at the structure of this book, and then we'll dive into the explanation, exposition of it. So the structure is uh, the nifty way the author helps us understand the major pieces of his book. Always want to do that. Always want to encourage you about that. It's, it's not something you want to avoid, something you want to look at. And in this book, there are three major parts to it. The first one is a really scary preview of the book because you look at the first three chapters and you think, oh my goodness, this is starting out badly. It surely has got to get better than this, doesn't it? And the answer is mm, no. It's a scary preview and it's going to get worse. And it gets worse in chapters 3 to 16, which is the only section that actually deals with the judges. But then it finishes perfectly, as I've said here in chapter 17 to 21, with two perfect stories. Now, they're not perfect in the sense of good at all, because they're not good at all. They're perfect in the sense of the perfect storm, because all the elements come together in a horrible way in order to demonstrate the point of the book. And when you finish the book of Judges, if you still have an appetite, something's wrong with you. You should feel sick and empty when you get to the end of this book. But the good news is, the good news is there is Ruth, which speaks to the problem. So, a uh, quick special note here. The Judges are neither chronologically consecutive, which means they don't always come right after one another. Sometimes the author rearranges their stories in time. And they're not geographically comprehensive, which means they don't all rule over all of Israel. Sometimes they're like regional judges. But their stories come together to make a powerful storyline. This is another reason not to treat this as a strict history of the period, because it's not exactly a history. It has been a literary restructured book in order to teach a bigger message. So let's, uh, let's take a look at where this thing starts. And it starts where Joshua again ended. And Joshua has given us the major, major conquering of the land. That is, he has conquered the big coalitions. But what he hasn't done is he hasn't driven all the Canaanites out. And this is illustrated best with Caleb. Remember the story of Caleb. Caleb says to Joshua, uh, Joshua, 
uh, give me permission to go drive out Arba out of Hebron. And Joshua says, it's all yours, man. Go after it. And he does, right? Now, what Caleb does is what everybody else is supposed to do in the book of Judges here. So let's get after it and see how it works. So we're going to start in chapter 1 here with a pretty good start. And the reason I say that is because the way the book begins is one where the people turn to God and ask for help. And that's always a good way to start. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, who will be the first to go up and fight for us against the Canaanites? Now, this is a pretty simple thing, but one of the errors a lot of people make in the Old and New Testaments is they forget to ask God's direction. And they don't. They, they do it well. And God's answer is a pretty, pretty obvious one. Have Judah go. Judah is the leader tribe, and so things start well. Um, that talks about how they take Jerusalem. It gives us that other story of Caleb and his daughter Aksa, who is married to Othniel. And lest you think that Caleb is auctioning his daughter off to get a job done, let me just say, I think he's a very shrewd dad. And he's saying, I'm not going to give my daughter to just anybody. I want to give her to a man of God who is brave and will do great things. And she is a woman of such character that she inspires him to do good things. Now, you might think, well, that's kind of a silly story, an unnecessary story. But hold on, before you get too far, realize that Caleb and Aksa are the only two Israelites who have a successful marriage in the book. From here on out, it's going to go downhill. And by the time you get to the end, you say, oh, if we could just have one godly man marry one godly woman and have a family, wouldn't it be nice? Right? Well, this is it. Enjoy it. It's gone. It's over. <laughs> right? Now, we won't get another one until we get to Ruth and Boaz, but, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. So what happens here is things go really well in the first chapter until we get to verse 19, which says this. The Lord was with the men of Judah. They took possession of the hill country, but they were unable to drive the people from the plains because they had iron chariots. Now, maybe it's just a little blip or maybe it's the edge of the cliff. And as it turns out, as you read the rest of the chapter, which is it? It's the edge of the cliff, right? Because the Benjamites failed and then Manasseh did not drive out and Asher didn't drive out and Naphtali didn't drive out and boom, man, we're off the cliff, right? Everybody is failing. And, and so, you, so you look at him, you say, well, well gee, um, were they really unable or were they unwilling? Maybe they wanted to and they just couldn't get the job done. And God says, no, no, no. It's, it's not the fact that they were unable. They were totally able. They were just unfaithful. And you know that because in God's evaluation in chapter 2, he says this, you have disobeyed me, right? It wasn't a matter of inability. It was a matter of wrong choices. And so what this does then is it introduces us to some self-destructive patterns of operation. And this is what the book is probably most famous for. In fact, we even described it like this. We talked about we're ruled by 400 years of the judges and we have a series of ups and downs, right? But actually, as it turns out, though that's not a bad general way to describe it, it's a little bit more specific. And here it is specifically in chapter 2 and verse 11, the very first description. It says, this cycle starts with sin. Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they served the Baals. The Baals, plural, because there were lots of different forms of Baal wherever you were, okay? So they served the Baals. Then, verse 14, step number 2, in his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to oppression. To which they respond in verse 15 to distress and they cry out to God. To which God responds in verse 16 by raising up a judge to deliver them. Now, as you take a look at this cycle, it's going gonna, it's gonna to repeat at least six different times. But the really bad part about the cycle is that it's not really a cycle. In fact, a cycle is kind of a two-dimensional thing. But verse 19 tells us you can't look at this thing in two dimensions. Do you understand what I'm talking about here? You see the scary words in verse 19 that tell us why we can't just talk about this as a cycle? Help me out here. Make my day. What? Yeah, more corrupt, right? They're even more corrupt. So 
This is not just a two-dimensional circle. This is actually a three-dimensional spiral. So you ready for the animation that's going to change your life today? Are you ready for this? I don't know if you are or not. Are you ready? Here it is. Don't, don't forget this. There it is. See? Wasn't that fun? Watch it again. Let's do it again. Why do I do that? Because what I want you to understand here is we're really going down the drain, right? This looks like we're going down the drain. That's exactly what's going on. This is a downward spiral. And so I don't have, have all the judges up here, but Ehud, Deborah, Jephthah, and Samson are representative enough. And just know that as we move down, things are going to get worse and worse and worse. Now, because most of us want to be optimistic, because most of us want to read good stories instead of bad stories, we, our minds play tricks on us, and we, we try to make bad stories into good ones. And so we try to make Samson out to be a hero. Oh, man, you grabbed that jawbone of the donkey, and look, you got... You know, by the time you finish the story of Samson, if you're not totally disgusted and angry, you're just not reading the story right. Samson is not in any way a hero. He is a complete anti-hero. And Jephthah isn't any much better. And, and the way this whole story is going to go, if you're honest, is it just goes right down the moral drain. Now, again, it, there's everything about us that wants to ignore that and say it's not true, but it is true, so get ready for it. It's going to happen, okay? So let's take a look <clears throat> at these stories, and here's how I want to do it. I'm going to move through the stories, and I'm going to, I'm going to point out a couple of things that you might have missed, uh, some of the cultural backgrounds, some historical backgrounds, something to help bring context to the stories so you'll know what they mean. But I do not want to just explicitly tell you answers. It's much more helpful for you if I help you learn the skill of interpretation, if I kind of show you the landscape and say, hmm, what do you see here? Right? So I'll, I'll give you the dots. I want you to try to connect them. So I'll, I'll help you do that, though. And here's how I want to help you do it. I'm going to tell you things to look for. So first thing you should look for, first of three things, is progress. So as we tell the stories, be able to compare the stories one to another, and then you'll see the trajectory and you'll see the direction where we're going. Number two, I want you to honestly gauge your own affective response. Now, when I say affective, I mean your affections, your feelings. It doesn't sound very spiritual, but it's very spiritual. The writer is trying to make you feel something deeply. You need to acknowledge that. What is that? How do I feel about the story? And then number three, uh, how does the role of women relate to the main theme? Now, I'm not trying to be cute here and relate to half my audience. I'm trying to say to you that theologically, the message of the book is best found in the way women are treated. It's fascinating. So watch it carefully as it develops, all right? So we're going to start <clears throat> with the very first judge, who is Othniel. And you will notice there, there are only five verses given over to him. So I'm going to call him Mr. Short and Sweet, Aksa's hero. And uh, about all he tells us is the cycle. Sin, uh, oppression, distress, and deliverance. Right? And he goes out, he wins the day, and it's good. And you think, well, that was such a short story, so simple. What benefit could it be? But I'll tell you what, by the time we're finished, you're going to say, oh, man, I wish we could just have a simple story like that where a guy just trusted God, went out and got the job done, and there was no big drama. Because pretty soon we're going to see drama uh, in a moment. Is there any progress here? Uh, no, it's the first story. Uh, how does it make you feel? Not very deeply, because it's only five verses. And how are women treated? She seems to be treated well. Not much more to say. So let's go on number two. Story of Ehud, the lone deliverer, or the left-handed lone ranger, as I like to call him. Uh, got any lefties here? Yeah, okay, it's always good to see you put up your left hand. It always makes me encouraged. I always wonder when someone says, I'm a lefty. Like, really? Are you sure? <laughs> um, but it makes a big difference in the story. Can anybody tell me why the fact that he's left-handed makes a big deal? Well, it, it, it certainly was a disgrace to have a disability, but I don't know if they call left-handedness a disability, per se, because there, there are a lot of people from Benjamin who were really skilled as, uh, as marksmen with their left hand. Yeah? I know, it's so funny, because a, a, as a right-handed guy, you would store your sword over here. As a left-handed guy, you'd store your sword over here. And evidently, the security team at, Moabite, at the Moabite Palace was not all that bright, right? 
they, they look over here, they find, oh, Zen got a sword, but he's got a two-foot one over here, right? And so the fact that he's left-handed kind of makes the story work. So let's take a look at it. And here is the setting. You got the Jordan River flowing down into the Dead Sea. Israel is here, and Moab is on the east side. Now, uh, the king of Moab, his name is Eglon. So just think of a big egg out on a lawn, and you'll have the name right, okay? So Eglon has, uh, has oppressed Israel for 18 years, and the text says he was a very fat man. Now, don't, don't interpret this in, uh, in you know, 21st century terms as though it's fat shaming. That's not what it's all about at all, right? We're not trying to say, hmm, you need to work out more. That wasn't the deal. In this culture, in this time, there's a reason for him being fat. And the reason he is fat is because all, because all the Israelite kids are skinny. And not just skinny, but you can see their bones because he's been taking all, skimming all the cream, all the food away. And so the very fact that he's a very fat man, his, act, his name actually means fatted calf for the slaughter, right, indicates the oppression that's been going on when, in Israel. So, as the story goes, uh, I'm going to read this, uh, a lot of this from the text because I don't, I don't want you to think um, I'm, I'm making it up and adding to it, right? So you'll know uh, I'm not embellishing. Uh, the text says he was a very fat man. Ehud comes to him and says, I have a special message to you from God. And the king says, oh, that's great. Special message, come, come tell me, come into my inner chambers and tell me the special message. And so uh, he pulls out his sword from his right thigh. And uh, as the text says, as the king arose, he plunged it into the king's belly. Even the handle sank in after the blade, which came out his back. Ooh, ouch. And he said to him, here's my message. Do you get the point? Get it? Get the point? Get it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and, then, and then it gets worse. Ehud did not pull the sword out, and the fat closed in over it. It's like, oh my goodness, this is way too much information. I did not need that visual picture. Except the writer says, yes, yes, you do, right? And, and, and it's only going to get worse, because Ehud locks the doors, runs out of town, goes home and kind of gets his army, and then, and then the messengers are sitting there, not the messengers, the guards are sitting there outside thinking, oh boy, I uh, <clears throat> wonder what the old boy's doing now, right? And I'm not, again, I'm not making this up. They say, Oh, he must be relieving himself in the inner room of the house. And they waited to the point of embarrassment, right? So they're sitting out there telling jokes like, oh my goodness, the old, he's having a, we're gonna, oh man, we're going to have to put more bran in his diet. He's just not, <laughs> not getting the job done today. And then whew, it smells in there. And, and, and again, it's, it's, it's kind of a very earthy sort of a story, right? And so they finally open the doors up and think, oh my goodness, no wonder he's dead, right? Well, then by that time, he had come back and they, in fact, uh, overcome the army because there's such disarray there in Moab. Now, here, here's my question for you. What kind of movie rating would this story deserve? If you were going to show this story in all of its glory, it, it would deserve something for violence, right? Maybe a better question is this, what kind of audience would like it? <laughs> if, if you were going to market this, who would like this kind of thing? Isn't this like seventh grade boys, right? Oh, they put the blade in a fat kid. Yeah, that's like, <laughs> it's a real bathroom humor kind of gross. It's kind of funny, but ooh, in a sick sort of a way, right? So what kind of change of progression do you see? Well, there's a whole lot more drama going on here, for sure. Number two, how does it make you feel? How does it make you feel? Yeah, you laugh a little bit, but it's kind of gross. It's not the kind of thing you want to tell somebody for a bedtime story, you know? But it's okay. How are women treated? Mm, don't think there are any women in this one, so I really can't answer that one. But we're just getting started, right? We just got two dots to connect. Let's go on and get third and four and five. Right? So <clears throat> fourth, third story then is the story of Deborah, the female deliverer, or as I like to subtitle it, JL and her deadly nails. Now, let me just summarize this story. Yeah, I can't summarize it. I got I to gotta show it to you a little bit. This, this is where Deborah comes to Barak and says to Barak, God wants you to take the army and go defeat the enemy. And what are his words to her? This is really, really key, so I want to make sure you see this. What, what, what does he say to her? What he says is, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Now, just stop right there for a second, okay? 
What, what kind of a guy is this? Doesn't this make you wonder just a little bit? I mean, it's like he's a male, but is he a man? That's my question, right? You, you won't go unless the woman goes with you? No, nope, no, nope, I'm not going unless you go with me. So she says to him at that point, okay, I will go, but the glory for this whole thing is going to go to a woman, not to you. Okay, okay, that's fine with me. So at that point, you suspect it's going to be Deborah. As it turns out, it's not Deborah. It is a woman called, named Jael, right? So Jael and her deadly nails. So the enemy general's name is Sisera. Sisera runs away from the battle, runs to Jael's tent for, uh, for safety. Uh, and so Jael goes out to meet him. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. Stop right there. This is, this is one of those things that you, 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 you will miss if you don't look at it carefully. Come in, come in. Don't be afraid. Who says that kind of thing? One of your friends, one of your loyal friends. Is she a loyal friend? Uh, read the story, right? So he entered her tent and she put a covering over him. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk. Again, notice the difference here. He asked for water. She gives him milk. Why does she do that? Oh, just didn't have any water on hand. No, no, she had water on hand. Why does she give him milk? For a reason. She knows exactly what she's doing. See if you can figure it out, right? And you'll see pretty soon, I hope. If someone comes by and asks you, is anyone here, say no. Okay, I'll say no, right? But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground, and he died. Well, I guess so. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> oh, I mean, all the way down into the ground. The poor guy is down there. And he can't get I, something wrong. I can't get my head. <laughs> okay. shouldn't, I shouldn't, you know laugh at the poor guy's expense here, but she really gets him. Now, do you understand why she gives him milk? She's a mom. She knows that when little tykes have been playing real hard in the afternoon, and they come in, and you give them milk, and put them to bed, and put the covers over them, what do they do? They pass out, right? She knows that, so she can go in with a tent peg and smash his brains into the floor. She knows what she's doing the entire time, right? And so, what she does is she obviously kills him, but I, I want you to notice here that things actually get worse because you'll notice that chapter 4 is all in, it's all in prose, right? It's right justified. That's how your English, our English Bibles tell us that. When you get to chapter 5, notice that all of a sudden it's in poetry. It's not right justified. This is poetic. Chapter 5 is the same story told in poetry format. Now, if you don't know any better, you might look and say, well, all the truth is in chapter 4, and chapter 5 is fluffy sentimentality, poetry, don't need it, we can move on. That just shows we know nothing about poetry, because the poetry is the most important part of the story. The poetry actually interprets the prose and even gives us more details. So watch this. Uh, let me talk to you from chapter 5 about J.L., and it says... Most blessed of women be Jael, wife of Heber the Kenite. Most blessed of tent-dwelling women. He asked for water, and she gave him milk. Right? In a bowl fit for nobles, she brought him curdled milk. Now, it gives us a little bit more detail, and it kind of starts to fit together. She brings him a bowl fit for nobles. What message is that going to give to him? Oh, she honors me. Oh, she adores me. Oh, she thinks I'm, she, this, is a, this is a place of friends. I'm secure. Maybe I can let my guard down and go to sleep. And her point is, yeah, exactly. Right? And so that's what happens. Uh, she struck Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. At her feet, he sank. He fell. There he lay. At her feet, he sank. He fell. Where he sank, there he fell, dead. Now, notice, of course, here we are in chapter 5. This is the poetic portion. Three times it says, he fell. Right? But we know he didn't literally fall, did he? Because you read the prose part, and, and the whole point, of course, is that he is horizontal to begin with. He's passed out uh, in the bedroom. But what chapter 5 is trying to say is, when you take two enemies on the battlefield and meet each other, and you'll find this language all over the Old Testament, when one falls before the other... They've gone down in military defeat. And what chapter 5 is trying to say is, you know what? J.L. is not just this woman. J.L. is a warrior. 
And these two warriors, Jael and Sisera, have met on the battlefield of her tent, and, she, and he has fallen before her, says it three times to make sure you understand who the military hero of the story is. And it ain't Barak. Now, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? I don't know. It kind of sounds sort of good so far, right? Well, no, it actually isn't. <clears throat> because, let me, uh, let me go even further here and show you what's going to happen in the rest of this chapter. Now, when you guys were um, in 7th or 8th grade, did you ever tell your mom jokes? They're funny, right? Yeah. I mean, nothing better than a good your mom joke, unless your mom's in the room, then it's not so funny. But, but you realize that we're not the first generation, you're not the first generation to do that. The very first your mom joke is right here in the Bible. And it has to do with Sisera's mom. And it is, it is indeed a very, it's a very biting your mom joke. Because here's what it says. <clears throat> what they're imagining in verse 28 is what Sisera, the dead guy's mom, is saying back in her house. Through the window appeared Sisera's mother. Behind the lattice, she cried out, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why is the clatter of his chariot so late? Man, he sure has been out a long time. I wonder if he's okay. Oh, yeah, wait, wait till you see. The wisest of her ladies answer her. Indeed, she keeps saying to herself, are they not finding and dividing the spoils? A girl or two for each man. Now, the English text here is very euphemistic because I can't even read for you what the Hebrew text says. It, you, would, you, you would be offended. But what it's saying is it doesn't say girl. It says a female body, a specific female body part. And what the wisest of her ladies is saying is, oh, boys will be boys. They're out there raping the Israelite women. Which, all the, which makes the whole scene all the more dramatic, right? Because, oh, their, their boys are out there just having fun raping those Israelite women, and they're having their way in their bedrooms. And then you realize, oh, my goodness. He is, in fact, in a woman's bedroom under the sheets. But he's not having his way with her. She had her way with him. And it's like, oh. Ooh, all of a sudden this is kind of getting sort of dark and morbid, and yeah, absolutely is, right? And, and just to make it even clearer, here is, you know, obviously religious ancient art here um, of the poor guy nailed to the, to the uh, floor. But do you realize how serious this is? Where is she going to sleep tonight? Oh, well, she can just take those blankets down to the local laundromat and get them taken care of, right? Nope. Nope, she can't. And, uh, um, you know, people just don't read this story carefully and they come up with these silly, silly... This, this, is, this is not a poster for girl power, okay? This is not... We don't want our girls to fight like JL. I don't know where these came from, Deborah and JL action figures. Or even, you know, even <laughs> little Legos, like, ooh, that's rough. <laughs> It, it's, it's easy to laugh at that, but let me, let me say this. Where is she going to sleep tonight? She has no place to sleep. And besides, if she actually had some way to get some clean things, you think she could actually sleep after the ordeal of this day? When she realizes, hey, we live in a society where venge, vengeance is a thing. And you think it's just possible that this guy's friends would not be happy that he was killed by a woman and they might come after me? Is that a possibility? It's not a possibility, that's a certainty. And she says to herself, but that's okay because when they do come after me, I'm totally protected by these really strong tent flaps, right? I mean, this is terrible. The, the, her life has just been ruined here. So what is the progress from one story to another? Well, this one's really getting messy, isn't it? How does this one make you feel? Mm, not so good anymore. And more importantly, how are women treated? Is she the hero of the story? Well, maybe in some very small sense, but in the majority sense of the discussion, she's the victim of the story. And why is she the victim of the story? Because she was thrust into a role she was never designed to have to fulfill. Why? Because the guy wouldn't do his job. Very clearly, the story says to you, God wants you to go do a job, and he says, well, I'm not going to go if you don't go with me. And she says, okay, then someone else, a woman, is going to get the glory for this, and she gets the glory, and she pays the price 
like crazy. And so she is treated badly because she has to pick up the role which the guy should have done, and he doesn't because he's such a coward. So maybe the story's going to get better, you think? Let's go on to the next story. Maybe it'll get better, <clears throat> but don't count on it. Because the story of Gideon is, a, is not a bad one, but it also has a sad ending. Gideon is really known for two things. He knows that Yahweh, not Baal, is the God of Israel. He's, he's got this name, Baal fighter. He also knows that the Lord, Yahweh, not Gideon, is the king. Because they want Gideon to be the king. And he says, no, 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 I know what you want. You want me to replace God, and I'm not going to do it. And yet, at the end of his life, he creates an idol, which the townspeople worship Baal by. And there's this small little detail that he has 70 sons, and he names one of them Abimelech. Is that a big deal? Oh, yeah, it's a huge deal. Because if he has 70 sons, guess how many daughters he has? 70. How do you get 140 kids? Well, let me put it this way. You, you don't do it with one wife. What do you have to have in ancient terms in order to get 140 kids? You have to have a, have a harem, right? Who has harems in the ancient world? Kings do. The name Abimelech means my daddy is king. So on the test, he gets the answers right. Yahweh is the God of Israel. Yahweh is the king of Israel. But he starts acting like Baal is the God, and he starts acting like he is the king. And so in his own personal life and his choices, he makes some pretty bad decisions, which his heirs follow up on and take to another degree. So there's the story of Gideon. We'll pick up with uh, Jephthah, a boy named Sue, next time.